My name's Gareth Owen. I'm the sound designer for Bat Out of Hell here at the London Coliseum. We have three of the biggest musicals uh, in London, Wind in the Willows at the London Palladium, uh, Bat Out of Hell here at the Coliseum, and 42nd Street at Drury Lane Theatre Royal. Uh, we also have Bronx Tale and Come From Away running on Broadway and all of those shows are using the new Avid S6L mixing desk. I started out in rock and roll and then moved into musical theatre and there's some quite substantial differences between rock and roll sound and musical theatre sound. Biggest of which is probably that in rock and roll your client is generally on the stage whereas in musical theatre your client is invariably sitting in the audience and there's often a lot more of them. I guess the other major difference between uh, rock and roll and musical theatre is that in rock and roll it's generally the person behind the mixing desk on a show by show basis who's making the end decisions as to how the show will sound. In musical theatre land the job of the person behind the mixing desk is so intense from a queuing and operating point of view that often they don't actually have time to be worrying about the details of a mix. So we end up splitting the job roles into sound designer and sound engineer. With the sound engineer operating the show, making sure the right microphones are on at the right time, queuing sound effects, setting up backing tracks and uh, generally dealing with the mix of the show. The sound designer is then free to worry about the EQ of the snare drum, worry about the coverage from front to back, make sure the vocal mics sound right, deal with particular reverb settings. This isn't a reflection on the inability of the person mixing the show, simply that the workload required to get a show to opening night is uh, far in excess of one person's, uh, one person's ability. That's not to say that we don't encourage the sound operator to uh, have a creative input but it tends to be as part of a team. So they may very well say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a bit of delay on this vocal? But the chances are they don't actually have time to deal with it at that given point. So we'll, uh, we'll throw it on a notes list and do it on the next run. At the end of the day, the sound designer has ultimate responsibility for everything that the audience hears. In fact, not just everything the audience hears, but everything the cast on stage hear, the orchestra in the pit hear, uh, and indeed even stage management and stage crew in the wings uh, on comms headsets. The ultimate responsibility for everything rests with the sound designer. For Bat Out of Hell we've been planning this show we've been planning this show for about a year. I think I submitted the first CAD drawings as to where the PA was going to go and how we were going to hang it and the kind of equipment that we were going to need. I think I actually submitted that about a year ago. Uh, and that was a deliberate choice because knowing how big the PA was going to be for a rock concert musical, I wanted to get my uh, bid for real estate in nice and early before the set designer and video designer and lighting designer started stealing all of the uh, best locations. The speaker system for Bat Out of Hell is completely DMB. Uh, we're using DMB J series as our main PA. We have DMB V series flown in various clusters for the upper levels. The centre clusters are V7Ps and Y7s and we then have flown V sub sub array uh, that's flown up in the middle of the auditorium and we have B2s and J infras on the deck for subs down below. Then there are an awful lot of delay speakers and surround speakers. That's a mixture of DMB E6s, E8s and E5s. The entire show is mixed in surround which provides an interesting challenge to deliver even surround sound throughout the venue. So as a result of that we're actually using what I call surround clusters. These surround clusters allow us to put the audience in the middle of the sound field in a way that's far more convincing than methods that I've previously attempted. Uh, it obviously requires a lot of speakers and a lot of amplifiers but it does give us reasonably consistent surround sound coverage for about 90% of the theatre. To get out of the S6L and feed into these surround speakers we're basically just using auxiliary sends uh, with a combination of reverbs and uh, some of the TL auto pan plugins to allow us to do slightly more fancy stuff. We did actually experiment with using Timax but it just seemed excessively complicated to achieve what it was we actually needed to do. The surround content is a mixture of the live music coming from the orchestra pit and recorded sound effects. The entire show is basically soundscaped through, so there's virtually no silent part within the show. We created a, a completely immersive soundscape that runs from the beginning right through till the end, and a lot of that content is mixed in surround sound. But also, we are deliberately mixing the orchestra in surround as well. So, although the vast bulk of the sound still comes from the front, uh, in almost every number we have some content in the surround, be it 
percussive elements when we deliberately want to jar the audience away from the stage uh, to simple vocal and orchestral reverbs when we just want to envelop the audience more from a ballad point of view. It's a reasonably large challenge to get all of this set up and working. I'd be lying if I said it didn't take a reasonable amount of time and an awful lot of pre-preparation, not just by me but by my whole team. Just getting the rigging positions for this amount of PA and surround in a theatre that's over 100 years old has been a huge challenge. Uh, my associate Ollie Steele spent literally months working on CAD drawings and arguing with rigging companies and English Heritage to get them to allow us to actually cut holes in walls, attach fixtures and uh, all of it has to be restored when we leave. So there's a fabulous example upstairs in the, um, in the circle where we've had surround sound points fitted and each and every piece of wallpaper had to be cut off with a scalpel in a tiny square, then a hole drilled, and all of those tiny pieces of wallpaper have been put in a photo album so that they can be restored later when we roll out again. One of the huge advantages of using the Avid Desk is the integration with Pro Tools. 128 channels over AVB, just from a straight piece of Cat5 cable, is, is really kind of easy compared to a lot of the other options out there on the market. We make extensive use of multi-track recording for the show, not actually so much from a sound check point of view, but from a forensic evidence kind of point of view. We so often end up in situations in theatre where people will say, well, I didn't hear that vocal. And we go, well, that's, that's because she didn't sing it? Oh no, I've spoken to her, she definitely sang it. And with full AVB recording, we can now go, pretty sure she didn't sing it. Uh, and that actually solves a huge amount of arguments because when everybody knows that everyone is being recorded from one end of the show to the other, they're far less likely to try pushing their luck, going, oh yeah, no, I definitely played that guitar riff. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Oh no, I was, uh, oh, no, I, I was totally singing in the wings. No, 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 you, you, you weren't though, were you? Uh, and actually, once people know that, it makes life an awful lot easier.